So what's next in option pricing? I thought I'd start by showing you some data. Now, data, we usually, the, the models we've shown, we've plotted the option price as a function of the stock price. At any date, you have a stock price and a whole range of strike prices. So the data I will show you is on a given day, what with the stock price being one number, what do call option prices look like as a function of strikes. So this graph here, this point here will show up the stock price is fixed, and now we're going to graph it as a function of strikes. You're going to see the same picture, but you expect to see a downward sloping curve. This one here, for example, is where the strike price is well below the stock price. Well, that's where the strike price is well below the stock price. So let's go look at that data. I downloaded these a while ago. These are the um, uh, S&P index options. They've got a year to expiration. And the top left panel shows you the uh, call prices. And you can see exactly the pattern that I, we thought we'd see. Uh, those are real data. <laughs> That's a line that I fit through them, but you can see that those data fit very nicely on a line, uh, as the Black-Scholes model says they ought to. And that line's approaching a 45 degree angle. On the right, I've got the put prices. They work the same way. As a function of strike, one is, a, is at the money, strike equal to today's stock price, which was about 1100 on the day that I downloaded these. Uh, and you can see that uh, out of the money puts and in the money puts uh, do exactly what they're supposed to do. So let's ask the question. I mean, these look visually almost exactly like the Black-Scholes formula. How well is Black-Scholes holding? And, uh, and, and what, are, what do these prices look like? Notice it costs about 50 bucks to ensure yourself that your stocks will never lose money out of $1,000 uh, roughly was the S&P index at the point. Sort of makes sense. With a, it was about a 15% volatility on this date. How about those out of the money put options? They look remarkably cheap, don't they? Uh, to protect yourself against a 20% loss, that's the 0.8, uh, it looks like it's only a few bucks worth of insurance premium to protect yourself against, against a 20% loss in stocks. So you can cut off that whole left tail for something that looks like about two bucks on the graph. So are out of the money options cheap? Or maybe they're expensive? Well, we gotta look relative to the Black-Scholes formula. Uh, the, these are, are pretty pictures, but they don't have the, 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 uh, the actual formula in them. So to make that calculation, our next graph has the exact same data, but the implied volatilities. So remember, this is the volatility assumption you need for each option in order to make the Black-Scholes formula work for that option. Uh, the at-the-money volatility on this day was about 14%. It's a fairly quiet day. But notice the implied volatility, the Black-Scholes formula says this should be flat. Everybody should be trading at the same implied volatility. The implied volatilities, in fact, are not flat. There's a little bit of rise on the right-hand side and a big rise on the left-hand side. This is known as the implied volatility smirk, that the way out of the money put options, the one that provides this disaster insurance, or a fee for writing disaster insurance, if you're on the other end of it, have an implied volatility much higher than at the money. And it's a big difference. We're going up from about a 10% at the money volatility to 26% out of the money volatility. So it looks like, in fact, out of the money put options are expensive relative to Black Scholes. You pay more than Black Scholes says you ought to pay for them. There's a clear pattern, it's not just random, uh, but you pay more than, than Black Scholes says you ought to pay for those options. Another way of putting the same observation, tying it into our last uh, lecture. We showed last time that the uh, second derivative of call price with respect to stock price gives you the contingent claims prices. So I took the second derivative of call price with respect to stock price, and that's the blue line here, and you can see it, it looks like a state price density auto look. The probability of getting a way out of the money uh, of, a big, of a big fall in stocks is low, and so the state price for buying insurance against that event is low as it looks like. But I also fit in the red line the log normal probability distribution underlying the Black-Scholes formula. That looks about the same, but about doesn't count, cut it in finance. In fact, these extreme left tails, the, 80, the 60, 70, 80, the state price is way, way above the probability. The log normal distribution says that a, a 20, 30, 40% decline just shouldn't happen that often. The state prices say it costs a lot to buy insurance against events that shouldn't happen that often. So uh, here I translated it to a discount factor. A discount factor is just state price divided by probability. If you buy the log, the log normal probability distribution implicit in the Black-Scholes formula, 
the, that state price divided by that probability, the probability is so close to zero that even though the out of the money puts are only two bucks, they should be two cents. So the ratio of state price to probability, the implied discount factor, the implied marginal utility in these extreme events is enormous. Ten, this is on a log scale, so that's a factor of a thousand bigger than it should be. So the fact is, presented either of these ways, out of the money put options uh, are, are much more expensive than the Black-Scholes formula says they ought to be. What are we going to do about that? You might say, well, let's just add risk aversion. Maybe people, you, we worked out a problem with habits where people really didn't want losses, but that's not going to work. The reason it's not going to work is the Black-Scholes formula is just by arbitrage. There is no risk aversion in the Black-Scholes formula. So we're going to have to change the probability structure as well as perhaps adding risk aversion. Just adding risk aversion won't do it. So how are we going to do that? How do we get past the log normal diffusion probability structure? Well, here's, there's, there's two ideas that I'll show you. Uh, and this sort of paves the way for just about every option pricing model there is. First idea is stochastic volatility. So it's clear what we need here. We need a fatter tail. We need a larger probability of the out-of-the-money options than the regular day-to-day -day volatility and normality is showing us. So here's the trick. Suppose we take a normal distribution, and then every now and then we switch to a normal distribution with a bigger, a bigger variance, a mixture of normals. So some days you're picking from this distribution, some days you're picking from the green distribution. The sum of those two distributions is a distribution with, it's got the, 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 the cathedral here, but then the, then the wide part there. It gives you a fatter tail than a normal distribution can produce. Now we need not just fat tails, we need a fat left tail. So how do we do that? Well. What we do is we, we have the regular normal distribution, and then we shift to this fatter tailed one in bad times. So if you're more likely to shift to a fatter tailed distribution in bad times, then the net result will be a distribution of one period returns with this fat left tail and not so much a fat right tail. So that's our, how can we put that into equations? We need stochastic volatility, and we need, we need volatility to go up in bad times, which is a good thing. That's, that's what we see. Well, here's a, a structure that puts that in place. Uh, in place of the geometric diffusion, D stock over stock, we have the regular mean. But now we will let the volatility also vary through time. Uh, instead of being a constant sigma, it's going to be square root of V. And then we'll let V, the volatility, move stochastically through time. So this is an AR1 process with a square root uh, term there as well. This just lets volatility wander through time. The square root nature of it keeps volatility a positive number. And let's make DW and DZ correlated with each other. So when there's a bad shock to DZ, there's a big shock to DW. In bad times, volatility goes up. That kind of process is exactly going to generate this kind of distribution which we need. So let's go. We know how to do this. We need to write down a discount factor and then do what we did last time. The discount factor, the first term, we, we know how to do. But we need to add, you know, there is the, uh, the possibility that uh, there's, there's, a, there's a market price of volatility risk. The discount factor needs to load on all the shocks, not just the, the shock to the stock price. OK. So let's add that in as a parameter and see what happens. You know what to do next. Solve this forward, then either produce an int you can solve that forward and produce an integral, evaluate the integral. It's not going to be fun, but you know how to do that. Or plug this into the Black-Scholes uh, style differential equation and solve the partial differential equation. You at least know how to program a computer to do that, or hire a physicist or someone who knows how to do ha hard integrals or solve uh, differential equations. The result you're going to get is a call option price. What's it going to look like? I, I added i to think about different options. It's going to be a function of the strike price, the stock price. Now it's going to be a function of volatility, which varies over time, so each date will have a different value of v, and of course time to expiration with some parameters in there as well. So we just get a little more than what we had before. Before it was just as a function of uh, strike price and stock price, and a constant v, now v varies over time as well. But there's only, for all call options, there's only two things varying. There's the stock price, which we observe. There's v, 
And from seeing 10 or 20 different call options, you can figure out what the value of V had to be. That's the implied volatility uh, for that day. And we have these parameters, but you, know, you can figure out one parameter from the data. So this will generate for you, it's, it's like a two-factor model. Uh, and, and you can figure out the parameters that you need from the strike, from the uh, call options as a function of strike, with this additional parameter in there, the, the market price of volatility risk. The other approach to handling this problem, and, and the other approach to op uh, option pricing models you'll see, is to add jumps. So here, it's the same thing we had before, mu dt plus sigma dz, no more of this varying volatility. But now, in addition to the diffusion term, the stock price can take a jump. I graphed here what I mean by jumps. Every now and then, the stock price just goes boom, and then the stock price goes boom again. And when it goes boom, there's a distribution, and we'll, it'll, we'll make that distribution have a fat left tail. Uh, so, so that's the new thing. That is what's going to generate our fat left tail in the stock prices. We write down a discount factor that also loads on this new shock with a market price of jump risk, and you're ready to go. Same techniques that we used before, just use that discount factor, price the option. It will be a function of this new market price of jump risk, uh, and it will, it will include the probability of a fat left tail and risk aversion that people feel towards the fat left tail risk. So you're left with pricing by mostly arbitrage, where you will figure out the risk aversion in the model. You won't use utility functions and stuff like that. You'll figure out whatever risk aversion makes all the data fit, but then you can fit, uh, in, you can fit 15 different options from only two or three. You can figure out what all those parameters are. You, can, you, can, you will have a disciplined way to price nearby securities, to price one thing in terms of many others, possibly to detect mispricings. That's what people use it for. To construct hedges. If you have to create one security, how do you hedge it with a bunch of others? Uh, and in a portfolio sense, to isolate the premiums. Uh, we will have premiums in there. And if you think these are attractive things for you to hold, uh, this, uh, this structure allows you to isolate the risk premiums and figure out how to hold those risk premiums without holding other stuff. That's pretty much the structure of modern option pricing models. The rest is hairy algebra and, of course, applying it to different kinds of options, which there's hundreds of different varieties. But you've got the principles. Mm -hmm.